happy to greet you again and welcome you to watch this program. I really enjoy talking to you in this way, although I can't see you. Um, I do, I, I like it better when I'm doing it face to face, but um, uh, as things are because of distance and everything else, it, it has to be this way at, at the moment. Although I can assure you that um, I'm starting traveling again very much. I've already been in uh, Pakistan and in, uh, in Uzbekistan, but um, within a short time from now, and it'll be uh, this, uh, the way this is being broadcast, I will have already visited the next places in Armenia and uh, Georgia and also uh, in Rome and so on. But all I can say is that celebrating my 90th birthday, as I have done just recently, that it's not limiting in any way my ability for ministry, for traveling, or uh, anything. I just feel younger than ever, so <laughs> that's good news. I want to talk to you about um, an issue which I do talk a lot about, but I feel very concerned about which is prayer, because I do realize that as I look back over my ministry that a number of issues have, a number of things have played a very important part in my life and my ministry. Yes, of course, um, studying the Word of God and uh, trying to follow its commands, its precepts, but also um, to have a life of prayer. And although probably my aspect um, uh, with regard to prayer is different to um, a lot of people, uh, people would not uh, easily recognize how I pray, but I'm going to try and show you because it certainly is effective, very effective in my life. And um, there are two things about prayer. One is that my father was a great man of prayer. Amongst other things, he was a student of the Word of God. He was a preacher. He was one of the founders of the Pentecostal movement in Britain. But more than that, he was, to me and in my life, a man of prayer. And I do believe that uh, in one sense, as I look back over my 90 years, that much of the influence in my early days was through my father's praying. And I suppose I am a product of my father's prayer. And that's quite something. But also prayer plays a very major part in my life. And uh, you realize this partly because of certain miracles in my life and uh, uh, one is the two times that I've been healed of cancer through prayer, and that was only through prayer. It wasn't laying on of hands. It was prayer uh, because I didn't have other people praying for me. I <laughs> had to deal with it myself. And the other is, of course, the uh, absolute miracle which I've been celebrating recently, which is of the release from prison. I was put in prison, as I'm speaking, 50 years ago and came out one year later, so it's 49 years since my release. Now, if I'm going to talk about, about prayer, I'm also going to refer marginally to healing because the first scripture that I want to bring to you is from James chapter 5, and basically it's in verses 13 to 16, and I'm going to read it. Because here James says, is any of you in trouble? Let him pray. Anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. If there is any sick, let them call for the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of Jesus. And the prayer of faith 
will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails. So now you have here two challenges in this, because in one it's dealing with prayer for healing. And uh, I have a little bit of a battle on this, and possibly uh, this isn't a full explanation, but I do believe that there are, in one sense, two different ministries of prayer for the sick. And if I'm talking about prayer, this is part of it. Because I pray as an evangelist, and as an evangelist, I follow Mark 16, verse 15. These signs will follow those that believe. They will lay hands on the sick and they will be healed. There's no mention there of anointing with oil. And I don't find it's possible in the vast meetings that I hold to even attempt to anoint people with oil. I never have done because um, I believe the authority in given to me by Jesus, and this was a direct command from him in Mark 16, is that this is an evidence and a sign that follow those that believe and have received the Holy Spirit that they will lay hands on the sick. And in laying on of hands and prayer comes the miracle. But in James, I believe it's a different situation because here we're dealing with the church. And he's talking to the church very, very strongly when he says in verse 16, is anyone in difficulty he should pray? Correct. If anyone is happy, let him sing songs of praise. That's worship. And then he says, if there's any sick among you. Now that's in the church. That is in the church, is any sick among you. They should call for the elders of the church, that's the pastoral ministry, who should pray over them, anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. So here you see a ministry in the church which I see as different to the ministry of the evangelist. Because, yes, I very often have to bring other people to join me in prayer when there's multitudes of people wanting prayer, but it's following the command of Jesus in, in, uh, in, in where it comes in Mark's Gospel, Mark's Gospel, chapter 16. But here in James, it is the ministry of the church. Now, I'm wanting to talk also about prayer in itself. And here, not specifically prayer for healing, but prayer in the more general sense of how I have to pray. And although I pray with the sick and I've prayed with Oh, come on, <laughs> not just hundreds of thousands, it runs into millions of people that I've prayed for because I can pray for 10,000 people in one meeting. But what I'm looking at here is the importance of prayer in our personal lives. But also, James brings a totally different concept into this. Because if you look at the command of prayer, I mean, you go back to the disciples when they were perplexed as to how to pray, and they said to Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he said, when you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and so on. You know the Lord's Prayer. But I do believe that that is a very basic level. 
And I don't use that. And in fact, because um, when I was a boy in school, we had a, an assembly every morning with a hymn, a prayer, and a Bible reading, and uh, the boys repeated the Lord's Prayer. But unfortunately, um, being boys in the school and not being Christian, they twisted the words so much so that I said I would never ever use that prayer. And the only time I've ever used it was when I was in the prison. And when I was absolute in distress because uh, I was saying to the Lord, Lord, I've been praying, I'm praying for food, I don't get it, I'm praying for my family to come, they're not permitted to visit, I'm praying for my release. And everything I said to the Lord that morning, everything I asked for, there, there is no answer. It's as if the heavens are like brass shut up against me. And it was only then in desperation that, um, yes, the Holy Spirit reminded me of the scripture, uh, that how the disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And I said, well, you better teach me how to pray. But when I did, it was... Well, you have to read the book because it was the most powerful, marvel experience of my life when it seemed as if the whole roof of the prison came off. I could hear the angelic choirs. I could sense the very presence of God. I was alone in the cell at the time. And so much so that in out of despair, I jumped up and I began to run around that cell, singing at the top of my voice, then sings my soul, my saviour, God to thee, how great thou art. The guards all came in wondering what on earth was happening, but they just took one look at me and said, oh, it's the Englishman, and left and went away. But from that moment on, everything changed. But that was something specific. But... Yes, there was some exhortation to pray. We should pray without ceasing. Prayer is Jesus taught the disciples to pray. Jesus prayed. He prayed with them. And the whole of the exhortation through the New Testament is very much on prayer. But the interesting thing is that if you look, I mean, if I turn you, for example, to Mark's Gospel, and I'm particularly looking at, um, at chapter 11 of Mark. And here, uh, what you find is this, that um, uh, Jesus is coming out of, um, out of the city of Jerusalem, and um, something happened. Uh, it's in Mark 11, and I'm reading from... Uh, Verse 11, Jesus entered into Jerusalem, went to the temple. He looked around at everything, seeing it was already late. He went out to Bethany with the twelve. And the next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it wasn't the season for the fruit. And he spoke to the fig tree and cursed it, saying, No man shall eat of the fruit from this tree ever again. Now, that wasn't prayer, that was a statement. And the amazing thing is the disciples heard it. So then he reached Jerusalem, it says, and he upset them because the money changers were there and you know what happened in in Luke he um, got a whip and he drove the money changers out saying you've made the house this is a house of prayer and you've made it a den of thieves and that upset the chief priests of course but when the evening was come that day, they went out of the city and they went back up onto the Mount of Olives. I would assume they're on their way to Bethany. But the following morning, as they went along, they saw that same fig tree withered from the roots. And Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Master, look, the fig tree that you cursed is already dead. And the reply of Jesus was very simple, have faith in God. 
Because I tell you that if anyone will look to this mountain and command the mountain to be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that he, what he says will happen, it will be done. And then he goes on to say, Therefore I tell you that whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you will receive it and it will be done. And then, of course, he says, and if you are praying, if you could hold anything against anybody else, then forgive. But what I'm pointing out is this, that here is very specific prayer. Because what Jesus is saying, and it is related to the fig tree, and what he's saying is this. He says, um, if you speak to the mountain and command it to go and command that mountain to be cast down into the sea, and from the Mount of Olives, the sea meant the Dead Sea, which was immediately below, but if you say it and you don't doubt, but you believe what you say. Now, that's a challenge. Jesus says it will happen. And I've actually seen this many times in my life, that it will happen. But because he's linking this to prayer, he goes on to say in verse 24, Therefore I tell you that whatever you ask for in prayer, if you believe in your heart that you will receive it, you, it will be done. So Jesus is linking exactly the same thing into prayer. That prayer has to become something that comes out of your heart in faith. Now, of course, there are other kinds of prayer. There's the, the simple requests and the pleas. Uh, but I'm looking at the kind of prayer that I need and the kind of prayer that I use in my ministry. And I would bring you back again now to James chapter 5. Because whereas in the beginning, as I read to you, it's the message to the church, if any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, pray over them, anoint them with oil, and they'll be healed. But he goes on, and he says at the end of that verse, he says, the effectual, and I'm quoting here from the authorized, I don't like the NIV and the others on it. They're, they're, they don't get it right, but the authorized is the only one that gets it right, where it says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails. The NIV puts it, is powerful and effective. But you see, the reason I like this particularly is because where in the, in the authorized version it says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails. In the original Greek, the word which is translated as effectual fervent is the word, Greek word dunamos. Now, that word dunamos in the English language is so often translated as either dynamite or dynamo. Now, you know, a dynamo, it's the thing that generates electricity for your house, actually, and also you have it on a car uh, to generate the electric. So the dynamo generates energy. So what uh, what, what James is saying is echoing something of what Jesus was saying, that the right kind of prayer will generate energy. Jesus says the right kind of prayer will move mountains, but it has to be linked with faith. And your faith, even if you take it from James, as comparing James with, with Mark, in James, that faith has to be dynamic faith. It has to be dynamic prayer. 
And it's the same thing in Mark. Jesus is saying, if you actually believe in your heart that you're going to get the answer, you'll get it. Now that's quite something because too many people when they're praying, they don't know, they're hesitant. Oh yes, I mean, there's times when I'm praying, especially on the mountains, and I'm asking questions. And uh, what I want to comment is this, that to me, prayer is not just simply what you might think. Prayer is a two-way conversation. When I talk to the Lord in prayer, I get answers. Sometimes the answers are given to me then. Sometimes the answer comes from Scripture. I mean, when I was, uh, both times when I had uh, cancer, the throat cancer and the lung cancer, when I was asking for answers, I got it in the Word of God. And the answer was so precise and so clear, it happened exactly as God said. And even when I was in the prison and I was praying to get out. Now, my faith built because when I was praying for the miracle to get out, I went to the scripture when, you know, I, I had to smuggle my Bible back into the prison. And when I did, I read scripture which confirmed the miracle. God had revealed to me in a dream, and I was praying over the fact God said that I would be out of the prison, I would be back in London, I would be in the Royal Abbot Hall speaking to 10,000 people at Easter. But only when I read the scripture and I read the words of David where he says, I will give God thanks in the great congregation. The Holy Spirit made that come alive. The great congregation would be 10,000 people in the Royal Abbot Hall, which was the dream and what I was praying into. So my faith lacked. And from that moment, I knew, I knew so much that if you know the story, I then said, well, if you can send me home for Easter, why can't you send me home on my birthday, which is three days before Easter? And again, I asked for confirmation and the Lord confirmed it in Scripture. And of course, the two miracles happened. One, the day that the Prime Minister came for me was my birthday. I landed at Heathrow Airport uh, in front of television cameras on my birthday. And because of the fact that that was headline news, I was asked to come three days later and speak in the Royal Albert Hall on the Easter Monday. So what I'm saying to you is this that we can see these big miracles if we do what Jesus said and believe in our hearts that we will have what we say, command the mountain, we will have what we believe if we ask. And that's why I link Mark 11 so strongly with James 5. And here in James 5, that word dunamos has two translations. It has translation as dynamo, but it also has a translation as dynamite, an explosive. Now, I learned a long time ago that dynamite was used in coal mines and so on, and it's also used in blasting to bring walls down and break rock, because dynamite is very unusual in that when it explodes, the power of the force doesn't go into the open air and kill people. What it does is it blasts against the obstruction. So if you put dynamite in a coal mine, it'll blow the coal out. If you put it against a wall, it'll blow the wall down. And so often we've got to understand this lesson in prayer that prayer has to blow the wall down. Prayer has to destroy whatever it is, whatever the obstacle is. It has to be like dynamite, but it also has to be like a dynamo and generate power in our lives. Now, this is the kind of prayer that I believe in. And uh, I put it into practice because in Caesarea, as many of you remember five years ago, that when the, uh, the authorities were trying to stop me, 
And I, I, I was so upset that I was praying, oh God, this is a battle, and a battle against the enemy. And oh God, you've never ever been defeated in battle. And I made the declaration, you will not be defeated. You, oh God, will not be defeated. And God wasn't defeated because God gave us the victory on every one of the issues including when it came to that storm, and the storm was so violent, it was the biggest storm they'd ever experienced on the, on, on, on the Mediterranean coast. And when I, in the name of Jesus, I commanded the wind, the storm to stop instantly in front of four and a half thousand people, the storm stopped. So what I'm really telling you is, yes, you can do it. But you've got to know what you're doing and you need to have the authority. And I think I need to talk about this again because this is a massive and a very powerful subject. God bless you. Thank you for listening. David Hathaway's ministry in Ukraine continues to provide humanitarian and spiritual relief to the displaced and those who have lived under Russian occupation. Daily, we distribute bread, water, sanitary items, medicines, and other basic supplies. In addition, our staff provide spiritual and emotional support to people broken down by war and destruction. Weekly, we broadcast the gospel in both the Ukrainian and Russian languages, and we distribute Bibles. Even though the Russians have now left the Kiev region, the fighting continues in the Donbass region. But despite these dangers, we will not stop helping those in need. To make a donation, visit eurovision.org.uk forward slash donation. Do you want the fire of God? That Pentecost experience will only come for one purpose, that you might glorify the name of Jesus. Prophetic Vision magazine is the teaching ministry of David Hathaway. Request your free copy and let God show you the path to revival in your life and your nation. Visit eurovision.org.uk forward slash contact. God has a plan and a purpose for you to fulfill. Through faith, you will see miracles, heal the sick, and your prayers will be answered. In David Hathaway's two new books, A Faith Beyond and Power Your Inheritance, you will discover that with God, all things are possible. Order these books today. Visit eurovision.org.uk forward slash shop.